Hi again, everyone. So um, welcome to SG STEM Talk and Trivia. Uh, my name is Marcus. I'm one of your hosts for the session. And uh, my co-host right here is... Hi, guys. I'm Kenan. How, how is everybody doing? Right. I think everyone's great. Uh, right <laughs> on the last day before phase two for the, for the circuit breaker. So uh, today we're extremely lucky to have with us our speaker for tonight. Her name is Miss Debbie Ng. Uh, she is a National Geographic Explorer, many dashes. Uh, she is the founder of the Himalayan Mud Project and uh, founder of uh, Hantu Bloggers. A lot of ground-up projects um, for conservation involving the community for animals, uh, for wildlife. So she is actually one of the first few speakers we have invited for to talk at SG STEM, although this is middle June, so we had tried so hard to get uh, to have her share her work. So we're lucky to have her today. And she's going to share with us uh, something that she has actually started up based on her work. And it works with uh, wildlife, uh, dogs, uh, disease, and some things that are very important uh, today, zoonosis. And it's also one of the reasons, um, no, there was a you, you hear that there was a, a community fundraiser, and it, there, it's also a reason why there is a white dog um, called Marcus running around in Nepal, which has uh, no reproductive uh, parts. Happy but no reproductive parts. So I'll let uh, Debbie talk more about work. Debbie, please. Thanks, Marcus. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Marcus and Kanan, for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to share about um, the work here on SG STEM, I absolutely love the series and it's super exciting to be a part of it. So the backstory about why there is a white dog named Marcus running around without reproductive parts is because we had this campaign where if you donate, you get a dog named after you. So Marcus uh, helped us out for that, for that uh, fundraiser, it's been fantastic. Um, okay, so I'm just gonna start sharing my screen. You can all see it. Okay. All right. So um, the back, a little bit of a backstory. Can everyone uh, hear me? Yes, uh, but Debbie, we don't see your screen. Oh, how bizarre. Let's see. Uh, sorry. All right, it's working. Yes. Well, now. Yes, that works. You see the slide, the big slide? Okay, yeah, okay, great. All right, so um, I am a photojournalist and a, a wildlife disease ecologist. Um, and so this is the backstory. In 2007, uh, I was dispatched to the beautiful country of Nepal. Um, so when showed up in that, in that place, uh, unexpected, I was doing stories on environment and development news with a focus on education. And these here are some of the incredible people that I met along the way. Um, I founded, as Marcus mentioned, in 2014, the Himalayan Mud Project, um, which is based in the central Himalaya, the Anakona Conservation Area. The main thing that we do is we bring vets, vets and vaccines to rural mountain villages to protect human health and reduce dog wildlife conflict. This, do, uh, this talk um, called Dogs, Demography and Disease is about basically the work in the recent years that we've been doing uh, with a focus on diseases. So this is a typical house in Manang, a village in the heart of Nepal's central Himalaya, about 300 kilometers drive or two days off road from Kathmandu. So this is a family in a hand cut a hand stone cut house and their dog is living with them above the, you know, on the second floor because this dog is still a pup and it is vulnerable to attack from uh, native predators like jackals and wolves and snow leopards. So it lives with the people on the second floor. Now, if you look in the middle here at the staircase, it's cut out of a tree trunk. You may have seen similar staircases around, you know, rural villages in, in other parts of Asia. Go down this staircase and you end up in an animal pen uh, where they keep sheep, uh, cows, horses, yak. Um, in, in this case, you, there's a sheep and some goats in, in the back and they are, they are inside a wall. So they are also protected from wildlife. So the people and their domestic animals are living together in this kind of uh, environment. 
Now I attribute a lot of my unique access into um, what I've learned in the Himalaya to this guy, his name is Mukia, born and bred in the Himalaya. Uh, he is a self-taught naturalist. Ever since he was a little boy, his hobby has been basically running around the alpine bush, tracking and finding and actually a bit like terrorizing <laughs> native wildlife until he learned like, you know, okay, he shouldn't be disturbing them. Now he is a wildlife uh, photographer and a nature guide. This other guy, uh, this, oh, my arrow went away. This other guy, uh, Ajay, uh, is also a colleague and friend, and he helps out with the uh, Himalaya map project as well. And we'll see a little bit more of him um, later. So one week, well, when, during one of the years when I was working there, Mukia had this, he's really restless. He had this crazy idea one weekend. He said, how about we go into the mist forest and look for red panda? So I was like, okay <laughs> you know what a crazy idea uh, not many people usually people like they plan a long time to do something like that mukia he just like let's go um so i was like okay he's so confident um so this is what the the forest looks like this mist forest about three thousand meters elevation so we are on the search for a tree dwelling vegetarian carnivore called a red panda and it wasn't long before Mukia was on the trail of one of these animals, he could see footprints, I couldn't. He found, you know, little bits of scat. Um, whoops, that's a bit fast. <laughs> um, and we were, you know, walking through this, this, uh, this mist forest, and then suddenly there was a clearing, and the floor was just full of red panda poo. Some of it was crumbling up and, and you know, compressed on footsteps, but there was so much poo, and I was so excited, it meant that, there are so many red pandas that have been here and now I was here and I was looking around for a really fresh intact piece of poop and this was it. It was warm, still moist. I held it in my hand and then I like made this connection, you know, like moments ago a red panda was here. Um, but that was the closest I actually got to a red panda. Uh, this is what they look like. I didn't get to see one. So this is a, a Nepali one, a one that from the uh, Nepal uh, Himalaya. I didn't get to see any red panda. But I did learn something from that whole experience searching for red panda. Because one of the other things that we did, apart from tracking around, uh, was interviewing villagers to ask them where they see red pandas, uh, what, what time do they come out, you know, where can we go, that kind of thing. And one of the constant threats that we found in all of the 10 villages that we visited was that it's really easy to see red panda because dogs bring them in to the village, especially in winter time when the rivers up in high elevation are frozen, the red panda like to come closer down to village areas to look for water. And that's when they come into conflict with domestic dogs. Not only do red panda uh, come into conflict with these dogs, so here is a medium sized uh, native predator, it's called a jackal, and it's being attacked by three domestic dogs. You can see the domestic dogs are quite much larger than the, uh, than the jackal and also outnumbered, obviously. Um, smaller carnivores, like this yellow-throated martin, they also often come into conflict uh, with the domestic dogs. They like to come close to village areas to hunt for, for chicken, because um, one of their native um, uh, prey species is actually the, the native birds, like the chuka or the Himalayan pheasant. They hunt those birds, which are very much like chicken. And even large carnivores, like snow leopards. This photograph was taken by a local indigenous yak herder with a mobile phone, so that's why, you know, it's a lower resolution. Now, it's amazing the kind of information we can get from these people that are working and constantly up in those kind of, you know, really remote places. Uh, they can really bring back a lot of important information with just some basic uh, equipment and a platform for which to share that information. So I found this uh, archival picture of an old lady with a Himalayan Mastiff way back when. And they have something in common, this picture from the yak herder and this dog in the archival picture. They have this big collar around their neck. I don't know if you can see it. So the, in the colored picture, it's a red collar. And that collar is either a thick piece of uh, leather, or it could also be a metal, um, there's a metal uh, chain underneath that. And that collar is to protect these dogs from attack by native, uh, by the large predators like the snow leopard. What does this tell us? It tells us that dog wildlife conflict has been happening for a long time. And people have been trying to mitigate this in the simplest ways. 
dog wildlife conflict is a misnomer. It really is human wildlife conflict because these dogs exist in the context of people and they have been for hundreds of years. Now, during this time when we were you know, up there in the mountains looking at this issue, local people, they're very uh, opportunistic, right? They see a bunch of biologists and vets walking around. They have also many questions, you know, they come up to us. And often when we have vets, they say, I have a dog that's behaving kind of weird. Can you have a look at it? So I'm gonna play this video and see if you can notice this dog has a bit of a, a, a body twitch. Um, and when we encountered these dogs, we thought it looked a lot like symptoms of a type of disease called distemper. So I'm gonna play the video. So it's got this involuntary head twitch, leg twitch. And we suspected that it could have recovered because it looks like it's now in good health. So we suspected that it could have recovered from a distemper uh, infection. And, but of course, you know, we, we, we needed to, to, to do actual testing, you know, we need tests before we find out. But if it was distemper, ha, huh, that's really interesting and concerning because distemper is a multi-host pathogen. If you look at this picture from the top row down, for a long time, distemper, it was only thought to affect canids, so your foxes, your wolves, hyenas, and all those things. But then slowly over time, we were finding it in mustelids, your raccoons, civets, bears. Okay, we have our red panda there. They're very susceptible to distemper. Even otters, sea otters, river otters. And then in the last 20 years, big cats, and more recently, things like deer, pigs, elephants, and in the few past few years, two primate species in Asia. So what is distemper? What is this crazy disease, right? Uh, distemper is actually from the same family of pathogens as the human measles virus. So it's from the paramyxovirus, uh, the uh, mobile virus, and the, the viruses are so similar, in fact, that the human measles vaccine can actually be used to boost immunity in puppies. So that's how similar these two uh, uh, viruses are. And the etiology is very similar as well. So you spread measles by being in the same room, sharing food and utensils. When dogs share food, these are some dogs, you know, chowing down on a, on a dead goat. These are opportunities for disease transmission as well. Another interesting pattern about canine distemper disease is its ability to cause what we call mass mortality events all around the world. And, and as you can see here, you know, a wide variety of species in aquatic environments, jungle and savanna, they cause like single outbreak can cause huge mortality. So here we have 51% you know, of seals disappearing in an outbreak in 2001, Serengeti lions, 33%, 1,000 dead lions in one park, one population. 90% of dingoes in Northern Territory, Australia, and most recently are uh, more tigers as well. Even though they are solitary, you know, they're unlike the other animals that are living in groups, they can also be affected by this uh, disease. I'm gonna play the video here of the lion having a, a seizure from distemper. And the whole idea is actually really just a contrast the effects of this disease in a novel host. So the dog is the ho the the prime the, the main host, um, but the lion is really the novel host. So let's see if you can see this. So that's what we call the chewing gum. It has a chewing gum symptom, and the poor lion is having a, a seizure. And and uh, yeah, it, it really devastates them. And of course, wild animals, unlike domestic animals, you know, they, they don't have uh, resources to, to, um, to, to feed or to be warm when they are um, uh, affected by the disease. So all of these things were so exciting to me, okay? There were human dimensions, there was wildlife, there was doggies, who doesn't like doggies? Uh, there's interplay between all these different um, um, fields. And it was a, a, a need in the Himalaya. No one had ever done a, a distemper study in the Himalaya throughout the Himalayan region. Um, so I thought that, hey, this looked like uh, you know, an interesting thing to do and useful as well, people were enthusiastic. So I actually went back to university and spent the last six years studying wildlife disease ecology. So the past, uh, in 2018, 
um, brought a team together, so some vets and a vet tech here. Uh, they're collecting blood samples, right? So is the disease there or not? First thing you have to do is test, right? So what do we find from the test? So on the left, we have plot A, plot B. Plot A is the antibodies. So of the 100 plus dogs that we collected, um, 100 plus dogs that we collected blood from, 70% were positive for antibodies. And the interesting thing is a plot uh, B, which is the antigens. We actually look for the virus and 20% of them had the virus, they had an infection. And why that was interesting for us was because when our vets were there um, collecting the blood, these dogs, none of the dogs we collected samples from had any signs of or symptoms of distemper. So they were asymptomatic, they had asymptomatic infection. Why is this interesting? There is another pathogen, some of you may have heard of them. It's called the Nipah or the Hendra virus. It's also from the same uh, family of viruses uh, as measles, Nipah, Hendra, they're all from the same family. Now Nipah, the uh, host, the natural host is bats. But when Nipah virus goes from bats into uh, humans or pigs, there can be death. So the blue cloud here is showing the uh, area that Nipah is endemic. And then Hendra, which is the pink cloud here, it goes from bats to horses and then to people. Um, it can also uh, cause death in humans and horses. But in bats, it is also asymptomatic. So it's interesting, like these viruses from this uh, family seem to be having this behavior. All right, so what is the distribution of, uh, what, what, you know, what kind of pattern are we seeing in the Himalaya? For this, as uh, Prime Minister Lee said, you know, when you want to do tracing, you have to go back to old fashioned detective work. And that is what Ajay here is doing. He is sitting down with a villager, asking him, where do you take your dog? Where does it come from? Where do you guys go? This is what it looks like when people are bringing their animals around the Himalaya. There's always this little doggy at the back. You're following them everywhere into the high mountains, places where there's, you know, not many people, but there, will, there will be a dog running around. We found that these dogs are actually not so kampong or rural, you know, as we thought. They are really cosmopolitan. They're traveling around villages to the cities. So in winter time, when their owners are escaping harsh winter weather, they bring their dogs into Kathmandu. So this entire journey, you know, a two days journey, sometimes they make a stop, visit a friend, buy some, buy some produce or something like that. Each of those places is an opportunity for picking up something, a pathogen, or dropping something as well. Now, so how do we, how do we manage that, right? Okay, how do we manage transmission in dogs? We can make them wear masks, but I don't know how efficient, how effective that is. It doesn't really look very comfortable for that poor husky that's ripped the, the ties around his eyes. Uh, and it, you know, dogs don't really socialize in places like pubs, so we can just, oh, just close the pubs, dogs don't show up. Um, you know, dogs you know, still find other ways to make friends, but there is another way to prevent dogs from socializing so much. It's a bit tricky and it's a little bit cheeky, a little bit irreversible. <laughs> called sterilization. Now, when we get sterilizing them, we modify their behavior, right? They're not going out fighting for mates. They don't wander to look for females. And also many species, including bats, during reproductive season, the added stress causes the animals to shed more viruses into the environment. Every time they shed more viruses into the environment, it's an opportunity for another animal, uh, whether it's the same, same species or another species, to pick up those viruses. So a lot of benefits for sterilization. Um, as mentioned earlier, the local indigenous people are, you know, very, a very precious resource. They're extremely enthusiastic and well engaged. So here Ajay is explaining to another yak herder, yak herder how to recognize and report disease uh, symptoms in dogs and other wildlife um, to keep an eye out for us when he's out uh, with his yak. Here's a look at one of our community sessions, a bit of, te a bit of tension, you see some people look a bit tense, uh, because learning about diseases can be quite scary, especially in communities where they may not have all the resources to respond, right? And that's what we are trying to do, we're trying to teach them how to respond, how to be aware, and what can they do with their limited means um, to try and work around this disease. Here's some of our volunteers who have stepped up, um, to be a part of our work is just fantastic. 
Um, and many of the tools, as you've seen, that we use in wildlife epidemiology are really relevant to the study of diseases that also affect humans, okay? Um, so a lot of the concepts that we use um, are really, a concept and tools are really the same. What can we do in Singapore to manage wildlife disease? How does this affect all of us? Okay, it's everywhere, right? Diseases are everywhere. So how can we manage it? Social distancing, very simple. This, these things like leashes, sticking to the trail, um, and right here, poop bag, okay? Removing poop is removing exposure. Sometimes our dogs may not be showing all of the symptoms of a particular infection if they are, if it's a, you know, just like us, sometimes, you know, we can get an infection, but then, you know, we only have a very mild sniffle. Um, but if, we, if it goes to someone with a low immunity, it could really affect them, okay? So the, this kind of thing protects the otters as well as protect the dogs. Okay? In past, the diseases go both ways. So I'll leave you with this. Happy dogs protect people and wildlife. It's super important to take care of the animals around us that we live with and care for, because by taking care of them, we are also taking care of our wildlife uh, and ourselves. So that's all. I hope you enjoyed that, and I look forward to hearing your questions. Thank you, Debbie. That was a really good talk, and I enjoyed the pictures. I always enjoy the pictures. Um, and thanks for putting the picture of the red panda in, even though you did not get to see one. <laughs> it's for you, Conan. <laughs> yes, I know. Yeah, I, I kind of made a special request, like, put that in here. Yeah. <laughs> okay, um, so uh, we've got a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, so I'll go through them first, and then after that, we'll go to Marcus and see whether he's got any questions. Uh, just want to find any questions. I got distracted by the big mastiff, and I was like, I'll surely take it to battle. So, yeah. <laughs> And yes, Gretel wants to know, uh, is there anything being done to restrict uh, the domestic dog attack on wildlife? Yeah, so um, the thing about Himalayan Mastiffs and the culture of how dogs are used in the Himalaya is very interesting. It's very unlike like Europe or Australia where dogs, uh, the dogs that are guarding livestock respond to commands from their owners. Dogs in the Himalaya are pretty, uh, they're, they're bred to be autonomous. So if they sense a predator, they'll run out into the mountain and, and chase it away. So the real thing that we are doing to prevent uh, conflict is just trying to, so as mentioned earlier, the sterilization. So the less dogs are trying to defend territories, the less likely they are to fight with each other. Um, the less likely they are to uh, produce puppies that then just become more dogs that will tend to dis like spill out of the village areas. So often what happens, most of the dogs' populations are concentrated in the village areas. And then when they have more dogs, these just spill out into forest areas and that's where they come into conflict with wildlife. So sterilization is quite effective uh, aside from things like in this kind of rural context where things like confining animals is very challenging and not really applicable because the nature of the culture is taking dogs out into into the wilderness so uh yeah ma mainly by sterilization okay um the next one is uh by sinway he wants to know if there are any monitoring or screening of wildlife disease and possible zoonosis in the himalayas sorry uh what oh. Uh, is there any monitoring or screening of wildlife disease and possible zoonosis in the Himalayas? So our project is the first throughout the Himalaya, it's, I know it's pretty incredible, uh, that actually has done a, 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 you know, a, 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 any kind of survey. So okay. when it comes to one of the, one of the uh, screening, if you talk about screening, one of the things that it uh, would screen for, okay, is this spotlight? I'm not sure what that was. Okay, um, is actually um, parasites in livestock like cows because cows are important uh, economic resource for the locals. So if you're talking about screening uh, for wildlife or, or dogs, uh, there hasn't been any throughout the region, uh, any kind of uh, surveillance or monitoring, but in, in livestock, um, cattle specifically, they have done tests because it affects their productivity. And that has also been interesting because, and here we go back to the red panda again, red panda, they're very small, right? They're very short and they walk very close to the ground. 
uh, and they actually have an overlap of gut parasites with with cattle like by 70 percent 75 percent so the animals that we bring we bring into so that's why back providing vaccines or, or veterinary services for all the animals that use the himalaya is really important for protecting wildlife as well okay um right uh so I, I guess the red pandas, uh, they share the cattle uh, gut biome because mainly did they diet or did they pick it up from like the cattle dung? Yeah, just we, they don't know exactly how they pick it up, um, but they, they share, they live in the same area where people bring their livestock to graze uh, mm -hmm. in habitat that is, uh, that is red panda habitat. Um, yep. So probably just, you know, I mean, a lot of the, the worms and stuff, they have eggs, and so the red panda just has to brush up against it in the undergrowth. And then when they're grooming, they can just ingest. Just it, okay. Yeah. Fair enough. Okay, uh, Nazri has a question. And uh, I had I was seeing the same thing as well. Wouldn't steri sterilization then reduce the uh, efficacy of having dogs for the purpose of defense? So I was going to ask the same thing as well. I was going to be like... Yeah, that is an interesting question. And it's a debate that has not only happened in Himalaya, uh, it has also happened in any places where they use working dogs. So actually, sterilization improves uh, the, the dog's productivity because they don't go into estrus. They're not spending time looking for, for mates. They can actually, they don't stop to have puppies. And most importantly, uh, shepherds and all, uh, shepherds or whoever it is who is using the, the working dogs, they don't have to cull the puppies, which happens every year. Every year, female dogs can have litters of up to two puppies. Uh, litters, sorry, li two litters of up to seven puppies. And usually people don't need 14 puppies a year. They may keep one or two, and the rest are culled by drowning, uh, hanging, or uh, um, poison. So in this uh, Himalayan region, where most of the people are uh, Buddhist, they actually really welcome sterilization because it's an opportunity for them to avoid doing things that they find actually really quite unpleasant. So yeah, so to answer your question, it actually improves the productivity because they can spend more time working, less time getting pregnant and all those things. Mm -hmm. um, and if they decide they want to keep a good breed for work, they can do that. Okay, uh, but when you do like sterilization and stuff in like, um a village and stuff. I'm sure you leave some dogs out, right? Because they will need some puppies in the future. So yeah. I guess some dogs will escape going under the knife. Yeah, so there are some um, like uh, heritage breeders. There are some uh, yak herders that they have certain breeds. So there was one particular shepherd uh, that we worked with. He had five dogs and we neutered four and he left uh, one. So this is, yeah, so they don't, usually when they have dogs, they don't need to breed all of them. So we are, we know that it's their choice, but we are basically providing the opportunity for them to have a choice. If you want to sterilize, you can sterilize, but also uh, if you want to, of course they need to, the animals to work and they need them to, to breed so they can keep some that they want to breed. Okay, fair enough. I, I thought you kind of went around and like, you know, <laughs> you keep the cute ones and the not so cute ones will okay. go <laughs> under the knife. All right. Um, and I think we have one last question here uh, from Gretel. Uh, how do normal people like me do a part? Ooh, great question. So what, in the Himalaya or everywhere? Uh, well, let's see where the Gretel pops up and says... In terms of pathogens, I think uh, like... Everywhere. Yeah, everywhere. Oh my gosh, pathogens. Just practice. I think a lot of people here are really outdoorsy, going out and stuff. We can carry so many things in our gear. Keep your gear clean. Keep yourself healthy. If you're traveling with your animals, like your dogs, walking in wilderness areas, make sure your dog, your animal is healthy. They're not, they're, they're vaccinated. They don't have, uh, um, you know, they, they don't have symptoms and bring them outside. Um, and yeah, things like scrubbing your boots with disinfectant. We carry all these eggs and spores everywhere. And really diseases become a problem when they go to a new place. They are not so much a problem where they are endemic. But when we bring them to a new place, you know, like from bats to a place that, that is not supposed to be there, uh, or like, you know, there are many examples of or like white, uh, white nose syndrome from Europe. It was brought to, to North America and then it became a big problem. 
uh, myxoma from Brazil brought to Australia, big problem. So just like people, if you travel a lot, if you're moving from distinct places, keep your gear clean, keep your animals healthy. Um, Cause yeah, a lot of these things um, are, are very subtle and invisible and we don't see it. So good to be vigilant. Okay. Well, if, if anyone is taking notes, there, there are your notes there. And um, yeah, uh, that is all the questions from me now. Uh, over to you, Marcus. Have you got anything? Okay, I, I do have one question though. So um, I'd like to know if this project is still active and if people would like to help, can they help or how do they help? That's a great question. So it's active to some sense so the people that we you saw earlier those volunteers it's been incredible they've been sending uh whatsapp images uh, videos and photographs from from manang obviously even ajay and mukia who are now in Kathmandu, they can't even get into the himalaya because there's a complete lockdown in nepal um but the people who are living in the himalaya uh, with their phones are sending us pictures um so they are you know tracking uh, the number of dogs in their villages. And what has been really interesting is because for a long time we've been having this debate with uh, the locals whether or not uh, dogs are being brought in by tourists. And no one could have done an experiment like what has happened, which is stop all the tourists from coming. <laughs> Only an epidemic can do that. Um, so now all the, all the tourists have stopped, but dogs have actually increased. So people are find, finding this very interesting. Where did all the dogs come from, right? They're actually already there. They're just not moving to places. Um, so that's one of the things that the people, local people are doing. In terms of joining us, um, we are always like, okay, when all this lockdown and opens up, uh, you can join us if you're an um, animal handler, veterinarian, vet technician. We're always looking for uh, skilled uh, people to join our, our team. So if you're doing any of those things, um, you know, more than welcome. To, to join our work. Also, fundraising. Uh, I think there's some people in the chat here I've seen who have been incredible with helping us raise funds at NUS or various schools. We had some schools and uh, Vilma as well invited us to, to NTU to give a talk to her students. Um, so yeah, we are, we are for our uh, community work is largely crowdfunded. Uh, and I have a fundraising uh, usually around uh, December, January, February every year. So look out for it. Find us on Facebook and uh, wait for the, the bell for the fundraiser. All right. Thank you so much, Debbie, for sharing uh, about this project as well as giving your time to us. Uh, I'm going to unmute everyone so that we could all show our appreciation for Debbie. So I'm going to unmute everyone right now. Thank yeah, you, Debbie. So I, I open up the top. Thanks, Abby. Thank you. 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 And I'm on it. There we go. All right. So as we are moving about onto this part, so we're moving on to the trivia. So this is a chance for you to contribute to the trivia pod if you're still interested to. Uh, you could use PayNow or you could use PayPal. And to take part in the quiz, it's really simple. So I'm going to type in the uh, Google SG STEM trivia. Uh, this is Google form. So we go to the Google form. Uh, key in your name under the name column. You could, you could play uh, by yourself or you could play with a team, uh, but also list the uh, contributing uh, your charity that you want to be, to be playing for in the next column. And the next few columns are the scores that we would uh, tally up at the end of the game. Right? So there'll be four rounds, including one bonus round. And today's team is NEA. So we'll find out what they are in a bit, plus one bonus round. So please update the live Google Sheet um, as well, so you have your name, your beneficiary. So there's an honor code for everyone. Uh, so we assume you are not allowed to Google the answer, not supposed to check books or encyclopedias, only rely on yourself or your teammates. And uh, no looking up answers as well. So at the end, uh, we want you to take a photo of your answers, either on paper, or you could type it out in an email uh, with your team name and send it to us at sgstem.com. 
talktrivia at gmail.com, right? So that's right uh, after we share the, uh, you share the end after we share the answers. All right, so um, let's go take a look at the form and once everyone is ready, we can move on. So I see one, two, three, four, four teams today. I still see some cursors moving around. Yeah, we'll give them like another minute or so, so people can go in and like drop your names and stuff there. And then mm -hmm. thing is you guys can do this throughout the quiz as well, just it's a lot easier uh, for Marcus to like uh, eyeball the list as, it, as we go along. So, yeah, but yes, gonna... uh, it's NEA for this week. Do a formula for the total, so you don't have to add up your scores later. So more and more names are coming on. Awesome. Exactly, Nasri, exactly. National dishes of Australia, <laughs> people are guessing. Native animals. Well, we'll see if it's, it's right. So I think Ginny um, is asking, I think she sent a message to me accidentally. Anyone wants to be a team member? So if you are interested, you could um, text uh, Ginny privately. Yeah, you can do that because uh, I think this is the first time here. So if you guys need a new teammate, you can ask her. Okay, so we have, I think we have, might be ready to start. Okay. Um, yeah, let's go. Uh, I will start the quiz now. And uh, the N in NEA is natural history. Good guess, everyone. Wait, 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 wait. Hey, I haven't done it yet. All right, so Prisha, so um, maybe we could, uh, right, at, right at the end of the trivia, we have a couple of minutes as we ask you to tally up your answers. There is still time mm -hmm. to type your name and uh, group. Uh, and your beneficiary in. So I think yeah. you can go ahead, but just have a piece of paper ready uh, to, to write down your answers maybe. Yeah, by the way, the answers, right, just write them by yourself. You don't need to put the answers in the Google Docs, right? The Google Docs just for your scores at the end. So just put your answers on somewhere. Right, let's go. Question one, nearly half of Singapore's blank species are extinct. Study was the title of a news article from January this year. What is the animal in question? Nearly half of Singapore's blank species are extinct. Study was the title of a news article from January this year. What is the animal in question? Fun fact, the person who wrote the article is somewhere in the audience, so yeah. But don't worry, they're not playing. Uh, moving on. With megafauna like tigers and leopards long extirpated from our shores, what is the island's largest living non-captive land mammal? With stuff like tigers and leopards long gone from our shores, what is Singapore's largest living non-captive land mammal? Yeah, we said uh, there's so many uh, qualifiers because we don't want people to say, oh, polar bear, so non-captive. Yeah, and land, and land mammals, so whales do not count. The question is, do transients count? Uh, no, let's consider resident. And also I decided to throw in like the largest land mammals ever, just for fun. So that is a giant elephant, Paleoxodon americus, and Paraceratherium, which is a large rhinoceros. And this is question three, the numbers are missing. In May 2014, the palm-sized Lisa Zampa was spotted in high numbers in Singapore and in some of its neighbor, neighboring countries. What kind of organism is it? What kind of organism is the palm-sized Lisa Zampa, which was spotted in high numbers in Singapore and other countries in May 2014? A, a fish, B, bat, C, moth, and D, bird. And to clarify, palm here is your human hand palm. And yes, not, not, a, a, not tree a palm tree. Palm. <laughs> yes, it's a palm size. Okay. As always, right, if you guys need questions, if you guys need me to go through questions again, just put it in the chat and I'll get back to it or someone else might answer you. The quiz community is very helpful. Just that y'all don't give answers to each other, which is excellent. Question four, which of the following ferns was described from Singapore? 
Which of the following ferns was described from Singapore? A. Bird's nest fern. B. Staghorn fern. C. The monitor lizard fern. Or D. Raysam fern. I see Greta has uh, put a comment that says my mum. So is your mum palm size or is your mum the biggest land mammal? <laughs> So once again, A is bird's nest fern, B is stag's horn fern, C is monitor lizard fern, and D is rasam fern. And, and during this, when I, when I was putting the, the questions up for this, I didn't realize that C was actually a fern. Like I've seen it so many times and I didn't realize it was a fern. I thought it was like a, you know, a non-fern plant. Okay, and let's go to question five. What species of animal made this sound? What species of animal made this sound? Yep, uh, so turn on your speaker volumes. We're going to play this sound three times. Three. Again. Excellent. Moving on. Um, and E is epidemiology, which I thought would be quite fitting uh, given Debbie's talk. So let's go to the second quiz, second part of the quiz even. What is it meant when a disease is said to be endemic? A, there is no vaccine available. B, it has reached epidemic levels. C, it is regularly found in a group of people or within a certain region. And D, it has an extremely high mortality rate. What is, what is meant when a disease is said to be endemic? No vaccine available, epidemic levels, regularly found in a group of people or in a certain region, or it has an extremely high mortality rate. So we found out that endemic actually has different meanings in epidemiology as well as in natural history biology. Well, was it a clue, Marcus, or was that a red herring? Are you throwing people off the charts? No one knows. <laughs> yep, just a comment. <laughs> yeah, just saying, yeah. I mean, I mean, endemic and epidemic do share a lot of similar letters as well, just saying. Moving on. Which of these diseases has the highest rate of transmission? A, measles, B, influenza, C, AIDS, or D, Ebola? Which of these diseases is the highest rate of transmission? Measles, influenza, AIDS, or Ebola? Moving on. In 2016, smoking prevalence is higher for adult males compared to adult females in Singapore. How many times higher is it? In 2016, smoking prevalence is higher for adult males compared to adult females in Singapore. How many times higher is it? A, two times, B, four times, C, three times, D, five times. People are starting to dredge their memory for people they know who are male who smoke and people who <laughs> are female who smoke. Do your own study in your brain. Yeah. <laughs> Estimate. All right. Ratio uh, of percentages. Well, how many, oh, so what it means is that how many times? So assuming if it's, uh, the answer is 5.2, uh, smoking prevalence percent for females. So is it two times higher uh, in males, which means 10%, three times higher, which means 15% for males, or four times higher? That's what the answers uh, mean. 
Okay, I'll move on. Uh, question four. Question four. With a new high of 1,158 cases last week, the number of dengue cases this year is expected to be the highest in Singapore's history. How many other times has the 1,000 cases per week mark been crossed? How many, time, how many other times has the 1,000 the thousand cases per week mark been crossed for dengue cases in Singapore? So this is also a public service announcement kind of question. So yep. do take care, everyone. See, we, we will need a number. So you, can, you cannot say many times, a few times, more than one time, you know, that kind of thing. We need a whole number. And for the last question of epidemiology, it was reported and announced by Minister Lawrence Wong that Singapore is planning to conduct epidemiolo epidemiology studies on blank to detect COVID-19. What are we doing? What are we conducting studies on to detect COVID-19? I think this was a relatively recent news within the last two days, Marcus, maybe? Um, he announced it during his talk last week, and uh, it was in a newspaper report uh, mid-May, mm -hmm. uh, mid to yeah. end May. And I, I know for a fact that this is something it's kind of like happening around the world as well. A few other countries are doing similar stuff, so yeah, could be a clue, could not be a clue, who knows. Moving on to the last section of the quiz, A, for astronomy. So uh, let's go. Let's see how good you guys know the sky and everything else beyond it. What space objects can create craters on the surface of our planet? What space objects can create craters on the surface of our planet? A, comets, B, meteors, C, asteroids, D, meteorites. Which of the following can create craters on the surface of our planet? Comets, meteors, asteroids, meteorites. And of course, I had to put the, um, you know, a little cartoon with the dinosaurs and their impending doom. Moving on. How many planets in our solar system have no moons? How many planets in our solar system have no moons? So I see Jeannie's message, right? We're so glad to have you uh, join us, Jeannie. Hope to see you again in uh, two weeks time. Yeah, thanks for joining us. Hope you enjoyed your first uh, SGSTEM session. Right. Ooh. And staying on the question of moons, on the other hand, how many moons are there in our solar system? How many moons are there in our solar system? Canon loves to moon us. Yeah, you, you've been waiting for that, right, haven't you? <laughs> the astronomy was a really good one, you know, like, we got a lot of good stuff coming up. And by the way, the picture, right, it's just like a bunch of moons from the solar system. So, yeah. I assume this one, I don't know if you guys can see your mouse. Oh, sorry, this one is ours. And the rest of them are like the other ones. Yeah, this one looks most like ours. It's so, yeah. also pretty, and there's one that looks like the Death Star. Uh, this one, yes. Yeah. It's got like a massive crate in the middle as well, and like a little mountain sticking out, so yeah. Yes, there is a pedal pop one like right on top here. And some of these moons are like really weird shape, like this one, like what even is that? Like there's two moons stuck together, I don't know. Uh, moving on. At their minimum, which is further, the distance of Venus to Earth or the distance from Earth to planet Mars? Which is further Venus to us or us to Mars? And this is considering their minimum distance. Yep. 
they are in constant orbit. Yeah. And if you guys can like look at the cartoon, you will realize there are only eight planets there. Because Pluto has been demoted several times now. So yeah. And I find it cute that like I was the only one who's got his, his little moon around him and none of them have their moons. So it's like, yeah, I was the only moon that matters apparently. <laughs> yeah, and Venus is to the left of Earth and Mars is to the right. Yep. Venus is the one who looks really done with life though. All right, last question. Uranus is a gas giant. True or false? Uranus is a gas giant, true or false? I've been waiting for Kana to say this <laughs> all day. So that is the last question for the quiz. If you guys can, once you're done laughing, if you guys can tally up your scores, not tally up your scores, you guys can just like, oh wait, you're going through the answers now. I'm sorry. We're going through the answers now. Oh, before we go through the answers, does anyone need any question repeating? Like, let's do a quick one, you know. Give you guys, oh, yeah. we're already on 8.56. Give you guys a minute if, you, if anyone need any questions. If you, if you want a moment to catch yeah. your breath after the guest joke. Okay. Question. Section B, question five. So epidemiology question five. regarding um, testing. This way we go. Uh, what is Singapore planning to conduct studies on to detect COVID-19, according to Minister Lawrence Wong? The answer is not people, because we've already tested people. Yes, it's not people. Hint. OK. All right, let's go through the answers. Butterflies. Nearly half of Singapore's butterfly species are extinct. Uh, and this was an article in Straight Times. Yep, so the authors uh, found out what we have presently, and they looked at the species we had in the past, but have gone extinct by looking through museum collections. And then they figured it out statistically that half of our species are extinct. Except and moving on, the Samba deer is Singapore's largest living non-captive land mammal. The Samba deer is the largest uh, and it will remain to be until the few of us in the chat decide to introduce tigers again. I know who you guys are, I know we will talk about this at some point, bringing tigers back. Moving on, question three. Lisa Zampa is a moth. It is the Second largest moth in Singapore, it is also native here. And the previous time when they did such mass gatherings was in 2005. So Lisa Zampa was a moth, was a moth, moth. Oh my God. Question four, uh, the answer is C, the monitor lizard fern, or is also known as the Singapore fern, Tectaria singaporeana. So this, this fern was discovered and described from Singapore. Yep, incidentally, it's the only species of fern that was described from Singapore. And if you want to see them, uh, you can go to Bukit Timah Nature Reserve and they line the main trail. And this sound was made by the yellow vented bulbul. So, it's probably the most common uh, part of our uh, dawn chorus that you can hear. And to those of you who are waking up to hear the dawn chorus, good on you. The Singapore, well, it, well, the same way asks whether the Singapore fern is common. So the monitor lizard fern, it's pretty common at Bukit Timah Nature Reserve, but once you move outside of our nature reserve, they're not common at all. So I think they do require a forest ecosystem to survive. And an endemic disease is regularly found in a group of people or within a certain region, C. It is regularly found in a group of people or in a certain region.
and measles has the highest rate of transmission out of a lot of them. So me measles has a base reproductive number of 12 to 18. Uh, in comparison, influenza and HIV have it at two or two to three, and Ebola has it much lower, 1.5 to 2.5, which means that measles will spread quicker and yeah, and wider spread, yeah, far and wide compared to the rest of them due to its higher reproductive number. In 2016, the smoking prevalence is higher for adult males compared to adult females in Singapore, and it's found to be five times higher. So it's about 25%. More accurately, it's 28%. Yep. But math. Possible reason uh, could be the national service that's contributing to this. Zero times. We have never hit the thousand cases per week mark before. This is the first. Before this year. Yep. So, um, yep. Zero is the answer for this. And the last one is wastewater or sewage water. So, Singapore is trying to conduct epidemi epidemiology studies on wastewater to detect COVID-19, but we will accept wastewater or sewage water. I'll give it to you if you say drain water as well. It's fine. Okay. And astronomy answers. Meteorites. Meteorites are what cause craters. So an asteroid is a large rocky object orbiting the sun. A meteor is a meteorite that does not make it to the surface. So it just burns up on its way in aka shooting star, and a comet is an icy body that just flies around, but it releases gas when it warms up, hence the tail of a comet, but they never, they do not enter the atmosphere and make it to the planet as well. So a meteorite is what uh, we are looking for. And the moonless planets are Venus and Mercury, two moons without a, two moons, two planets without moons in our solar system are Venus and Mercury. And 181 moons. There are 181 moons in our solar system. And Jupiter has 63 moons, which means it owns more than one third of all of our moons. And the distance is greater from us to our rocky red neighbor, Mars. Uh, the distance between Mars and Earth is about 55.7 million kilometers while Venus and us share a distance of 34.6 million kilometers. And Uranus is not a gas giant, it is a ice giant. It is a cold ice giant. And the other ice giant in our solar system is Neptune. Jupiter is a gas giant. So yeah. Uh, question one's answer for astronomy is uh, meteorite. Meteorites, D meteorites. Okay, um, tally up your answers before we go on to the bonus round. So this is the point where you guys can go and go to tinyurl.com slash trivia to tally up your scores and wager your points. Marcus will exp explain this better than I can ever do. Go Marcus. Yep. And, and, and then, okay, so what's gonna happen now is that please tally up your answers um, for each section and put it inside the Google Sheet. I see most of you have done that already. And there is an automatic um, totaling done on the sheet. And what's going to happen now is we're going to move on to the bonus round. And this allows you to uh, get ahead if you're already ahead or catch up if you are thinking you are slightly behind. So what you do is that you can wager your points. If you got full points for every section, you would have 15 points in total. And you can wager from one point to the max, up to the maximum number of points you have, so one point to 15 points. But what happens is that if you get the bonus question correct, you gain the number of points you wager. But if you got the bonus question wrong, uh, you lose the number of points if you're wrong. So if you, are, if you have 15 points, you wager 10 points. If you got it correct, you get 15 plus 10, which is 25 points. If you got the bonus question wrong, it would be 15 minus 10 you end up with five points, right? So please fill in your wager amount 
into the Google Sheets. Okay, I think that all teams have their wagers in. Okay. So why don't we go ahead and review the bonus question? Sure. And also for um, first time players, right, the bonus question is always based on the talk. So today's talk uh, by Debbie. How many percent of the dogs in Debbie's study in Nepal tested positive for the canine distemper antibodies? How many percent of the dogs in Debbie's study in Nepal te tested positive for canine distemper CDV antibodies? Yep. So remember, she did two kinds of tests. One was uh, to test the serum for antibodies. The other one is a PCR test for active uh, infections. So we are asking for the first one. So it would be a percentage number. We will accept a plus minus 5% difference from the actual number. Okay, um, I think we can go for it. All right, uh, does anyone need more time before we go? I don't think so, right? This Shout me in the chat if you need more time. If not, uh, we can go on to the answers. Yeah, shall I, Marcus? Uh, yes, please. Okay. 70%, about 70% of the dogs in Debbie's study in Nepal tested positive for CDV antibodies. We will accept anywhere between 65 to 75. So that's quite a scary number. So one in seven dogs uh, were infected with canine distemper virus before in the study site. So that shows that how important this, this work is for both wildlife uh, and dogs as well. Marcus, do you want to do that thing where we give people an extra point if they get the number right, like on the dot? Um, sure thing. So if you've okay. got 70% uh, correct, uh, you get one extra point. Yeah, so if you get 70%, you can add another point to your major, your main one. Otherwise, if you get 65 to 75, you can just put the normal number of points. And uh, Marcus, do you want to... Looking yeah. at the grand total now. So now as we said 7 and 10. Is that, yeah, yeah, I, I might have said wrongly. So 7 and yeah. 10 dogs. Because you, are, you said 1 in 7, so yeah. Oh. Oof. Okay, so uh, thanks for playing. Um, we would get an answer on the possible winner today, which seems seems to be Sand Slash. Oh, All no, right, not, so not Sand Slash again. <laughs> yeah, well, Sand Shoe. So Sand, Sand Shoe has evolved to Sand Slash. So con congrats. We're gonna go through your answers, but first we need your answers. Um, so please submit a photo or the text of your answers to sgstamp toptrivia at gmail.com. We'll go through everybody's answers and uh, we'll also tally up how much there is there in the trivia pot. And um, we'll update everyone with an email and if you're on our website as well. Right? Yep. So, but we will probably let you guys know uh, the official winner by like tonight or tomorrow. So watch for us on Twitter, Facebook, you know, the usual spots and we will update it there. Okay, so we'll go to the next slide. We have a preview of uh, what's to come in a fortnight. Oh, okay. Oh, here, here, this is here as well, and ta-da. Right, so um, our next speaker is, uh, in two weeks' time, is Dr. Jessica Lee from Wildlife Reserve Singapore. We don't have the full details of her talk yet, uh, but it would be about, be about conservation and our guess about birds since uh, Jessica the of course, of course. <laughs> big person. Right, so look forward to that. We haven't created um, the sign up uh, link yet that would come with time and we'll email everyone who has sent it today and check out our Facebook page uh, and our Twitter as well when we will announce when the event is ready to be up. Yeah, I think we sh should probably have it like up Monday, Tuesday, sometime next week. So, you know, we like the rest of the weekends. So, yeah, so you guys know what's happening in two weeks time. So, Looking forward to seeing everyone then.